Welcome back, everybody. This is Each One, Reach One, hoping to teach and to reach one with another lesson, Lord willing. Thank you for stopping by the channel. Let us give all praise, honor, and all glory to our Heavenly Father, Abba Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and none other. And uh, let us give thanks for the Holy Spirit, without which we wouldn't be here right now pursuing truth. Uh, one of the spirits that accompanies the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom, <clears throat> along with the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of understanding. All of these are gifts of the Most High God. You got to have them in order to reach the destination that, that we are we are all hoping to reach. And the only way you can receive these gifts is to ask for them in righteousness. And if it's given unto you to receive the knowledge that you're looking for, then the spirits that you're requesting to be sent to you, to aid you in your and your journey will be sent to you. Otherwise, if it's not for you, you will remain in the darkness. You will fight against the truth at all costs. In which case, you know, there's nothing anybody can do for you. We just be fighting against God. And so I don't attempt to try to force anything down anybody's throats. I just present the information. And, you know, the most high God provides the, the increase. He waters the seeds. And so, you know, that's what you got to turn to in order to be given, you know, the, the lightning of the eyes, right? The ability to see, the ability to hear, and the ability to understand. All right, now with that said, we are continuing in prophecy and promise, but we're taking a bit of a, of a divergence, all right? We're going to, you know, go down a, a, a back alley, all right? We're still going in the same direction, but we're going to get off the main highway on this one a little bit and just get into something that kind of aids us in this journey. All right. So we are starting in Proverbs chapter 25, beginning with verse two. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, <clears throat> excuse me, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So this is pretty clear. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. And this is what he does. He conceals the truth. He hides the truth for the wise, for the prudent, for those who love wisdom and diligently seek her. It's not given unto everybody. This is the reason why your pastors in, in, in the Christian churches have been long studying and preaching and trying to teach the book but they have not been able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And now that we are in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and knowledge is being increased and the sons of the Most High God are being awakened, now the truth is pouring forth. We are awakening and we are doing exactly what our power put in our spirit to do, which is to search out a matter. And we are searching out all things concerning our God. But many people are not doing this. They are content with going to church or listening to an online sermon and having feel-good things spewed their way. They never get into the meat of the book. They never precept properly, if at all. They bring out a couple scriptures and they spend most of the time, you know, just talking, right? Just talking, not talking out of the book, but just talking. And I've seen it and it's it's the damnest thing that you can watch and you wonder how is it that anybody could ever learn of God when that's what they're receiving when they go to the people who are supposed to be the learned of God, but are not, but are false prophets. And so here I am and here we are. All right. We are searching out a matter, the truth. What is it that God has stored in prophecy, in his holy scriptures, in his holy written word that we are supposed to find? We are supposed to diligently search out. Search out. You can't search out a matter if you discount half of the book or three quarters of the book or any portion of the book. 
You're not a true seeker of the truth. Right? So Christianity has put you guys in a trick bag. It's conditioned you, trained you to not search out the matter. Just take what we give you. Trust us that we know what we're talking about. We know better than you. Don't you dare try to go and read the scriptures for yourselves because you're, you know, you're just idiots. You didn't go to seminary school. It's impossible for you to get to understand what's going on in this book. That's how they treat you. All right, so let's continue. Let's go into Job chapter 28. Verse 12. Look at the subject. The search for wisdom is harder. But where shall wisdom be found? <clears throat> Excuse me again. And where is the place of understanding? Right? So where can, where shall wisdom be found and where is the place of understanding? You see, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding are always separated. Right? They're not considered one and the same thing as many would believe they are. And they're also likened unto spirits, right? Whether that be literal or figurative, only God knows, right? But because they are called the spirits individually in the Bible, I'm going to say he knows what he was talking about and he was being specific for us so that we could know the truth of the thing and that they are absolutely spirits literal spirits all right so man knoweth not the price thereof the price of wisdom and understanding neither is it found in the land of the living the depth saith it is not in me and the sea saith it is not with me it cannot be gotten for gold neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof stop going to church <clears throat> And giving them your money in hopes for blessings, in hopes for their, their prayers, in hopes of being given wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. These gifts from God are without payment. You do not have to pay for them with any sort of worldly currency. All right? It cannot be valued with the gold of our fear, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or, or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be equaled with pure gold. Whence then cometh wisdom, and where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living. You see that? It is hid from the eyes of all living. It's not readily available. The most High God, he hid wisdom. He hid understanding. For the appointed times, we are now in those appointed times, and you should now be searching for these things. Not waiting for your Christian pastors to tell it to you. You should be searching. I implore you to search the scriptures. Study for yourselves to show thyself approved. Workmen that need it not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of God. This is the task given unto the sons of God. If you have not had it in your spirit to do this, well, you know, I, I'm i going to have to be the bearer of bad news. You bear witness that you are not the son or daughter of God. Now, with that said, let me give a caveat. We are all awakened in different times. Not everybody awakened at the same time. So just because you have not awakened a long time ago does not mean you cannot be the son or daughter of God. That's not what that means. I want to make sure I keep this very, very clear. All right. We were given the parable of the laborers, you know, being sent into the master's vineyard and that they are called in different times of the day. 
and that they all receive the same payment. All right. I'm not going to be one of those laborers who try to look down upon or be angry with or mad at anyone who is new to the awakening, who is a new laborer in my God's vineyard. I welcome all. I'm thankful that you're here. And because he loves you enough to send you, I welcome you and I love you. Because who am I to be at odds with anybody that my God loves, cares for, and has approved of? I'm not that person. There are many out there in this truth that are exactly like that, but I'm not one of them. Whoever he's down with, I'm down with you also. Whoever he sends, that's his business, right? We, we have no say-so over our father's business, all right? So he's seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death say, we have heard the fame thereof with our ears. God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. For he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven to make the weight for the winds, and he weigheth the waters by measure. When he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then did he see it and declare it. He prepared it, yea, and searched it out. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. That's a strong way to finish. Let's reiterate. The f and unto man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. So because you know that the fear of the Lord is wisdom, you should be able to look around and tell those people by their fruit who are not in the fear of the Lord, indicating to you that they don't have wisdom and they don't have understanding. Anyone is preaching to you a replacement theology has not departed from, under, I'm sorry, they have they have not departed from evil, so they lack understanding. They have no fear of the Lord because they call his, his promises void. They call him a liar. They say that he will not indeed fulfill his word as he said that he would. That means they have no fear. They are trying, they are taking away and adding to the scriptures. Though he said that anyone who does that, they will be written out of the book of life and all of the curses of the book will come upon them. So by doing these things, they're proven they have no fear of the Lord. They don't, they don't fear what he says he's going to do to them. Again, and you know them by their fruit. Right? All right. Uh, you know what? I'm not going to get that right now. I'll, I'll come back to the chapter. I was going to skip ahead, but nope, I'm going to stay the course. I'm going to stay right in line with uh, what I wanted to do. Let's get 2nd Ezra chapter 4, verse 22. 2nd then answered I, this is Ezra, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord, let me have understanding. He was just having a conversation with the angel of the Lord. And he was being told that he didn't really understand things the way he thought he did or the way he ought to understand. And that he was searching out things that were too high for him. But remember, it is the, it, you know, we're supposed to search out a matter, right? We're supposed to search out a matter. And Ezra, he was hungry for righteousness, very thirsty for righteousness. So he was in constant search of all things that, that he was inquisitive of, things that came to his mind, things that puzzled him. And sometimes they let him down a path that caused the most high to kind of, you know, try to get him back, you know, in, in the sight of his right mind, because he would think of things that were too high for him. And so this is, this is what just happened. And so he said, and now he's asking, 
I beseech thee, O Lord, let me have understanding. Please enlighten my understanding. Open up my understanding and allow me to know. Give me wisdom. This is what he is doing. This is what we have to do. You have to do this in your walk. Otherwise, you won't be given the knowledge that you're seeking. It will be closed to you. You will remain in the darkness because you didn't ask for these things to be given to you. The Lord wants to give to those who he deems worthy everything that we're asking for, but he wants us to ask so that when he gives them to us, that we'll appreciate the fact that he gave it to us because we are supposed to glorify him in all things. We're supposed to praise him for all things. He don't want us to feel as if, you know, we came to an understanding on our own or as if we were just so smart and so wise on our own that we didn't need him. He wants us to need him and we do need him. And he shows us that we need him by not allowing you to understand the things which he has hidden. If you don't first come to him and ask for them to be shown to you. And just because you ask, it don't mean it's going to be shown to you because it's not given to everybody. He just may close the door in your face and say, I do not, I have not known you depart from me. You that work iniquity. I'm not going to give you what you're looking for. no, it is not meat to give the children's bread unto dogs. Right? Sound familiar? All right. So, verse 23, continuing. For it was not my mind to be curious of the high things, but of such as pass by us daily, namely, wherefore Israel is given up as a reproach to the heathen. And for what caused the people whom thou hast loved is given over unto un godly nations. Israel is the nation which he has loved. The, the world without end. Israel, the world of Israel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the world of Israel. He only loved Israel. That's the reason why Ezra is saying, for the people whom thou hast loved. And he's not talking about everybody. He's talking about Israel only. But if Most High God loved everybody, one, Ezra wouldn't have said this. And two, if he would have said so um, in ignorance, he would have been corrected for it. But he was not corrected because he was not in error when he made the statement that Israel are the people whom he has loved. And why the law of our forefathers is brought to naught and the written covenants come to none effect. And we pass away out of the world as grasshoppers. And our life is astonishment and fear. And we are not worthy to obtain mercy. No, we are not worthy. That's why the gift of mercy is so great. It's so amazing. It makes our power worthy of love, honor, obedience, reverence. Because he gives us that which we have not earned. And we can't earn it. Right? Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We pass away out of the world as grasshoppers and our life is astonishment and fear. This is another mark of the Israelites that we would continue to have generation after generation. We would live in constant, aston in constant astonishment and fear. We would have no assurity of our lives. What will he then do unto his name whereby we are called? Of these things have I asked. Then answered he me and said, the more thou searchest, the more thou shalt marvel. For the world hasteth fast to pass away, to pass away. And this is true. The more you study, the more you marvel, the more unbelievable, you know, what you find will become. Because the more you study, you realize that you don't know everything and that the Most High does not give you all things right away. He breadcrumbs you toward him. He gives you a little piece at a time and he keeps leading you toward him. He keeps you hungry. He doesn't allow you to be filled so that you continue your journey. You continue your trek into his loving arms. So we're supposed to constantly be seeking and searching. 
but he's not going to give us the 100% truth and understanding of everything until, until we are glorified. That's when it'll happen in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That's when it'll happen. Right? You shall marvel because what you find is, is that if you are a person who studies the scriptures a lot, what you learn is that it's like reading the scriptures afresh all the time because you will constantly be given nuggets of truth and wisdom that you didn't have before. And it's almost like reading the book for the first time. It's almost like, you have, have you ever been looking for something and you were searching and searching and searching and searching and searching and you just couldn't find it? And then... Boom, almost as if like magic, like somebody was, was pranking you. It just appeared right there in your face in the very same place that you were looking in for a long time. It's like, wait a minute. I know that this hasn't been here the whole time. Right in my face? How did I not see it right here in my face? Man, I lifted up this cushion a thousand times, man, and it wasn't there. I swear this wasn't there before. That's kind of what it's like studying the scripture. <laughs> and it's it's wonderful, man. It, it, it makes it it's, it makes it fun. <clears throat> it makes it fun to search through, this, through the holy written word of God because you never know what you're going to find and when you're going to find that great nugget. You never know what he's going to deliver to you that time. And it's a marvel. Verse 27. And cannot comprehend the things that are promised to the righteous in time to come. See, he told Ezra that he was unable to comprehend the things that are promised to the righteous in time to come. For this world is full of unrighteousness and infirmities. Right? And we now, we still cannot fully comprehend the things that are promised to the righteous in time to come. But we are being given more understanding of things now than e even Ezra's had in his time because knowledge is being increased. It was not time yet for that understanding that Ezra's, Ezra's was looking for to be given unto men. But as concerning the things whereof thou askest me, I will tell thee for the evil is sown but the destruction thereof is not yet come, right? So the evil is sown, meaning in his time. The evil that would come about in due time, aka our present time, it was already sown like a seed planted. And now that plant is grown up and it is bearing its fruit. That's what's going on right now. We are now able to see the fruit on the evil tree, trees that were planted back then, that were merely seeds at the time when Ezra is giving the, these prophecies, when he's having this discussion. But now we're able to see, right? If therefore that which is sown be not turned upside down, meaning the evil tree. And here, remember, in this case, we're talking about evil people, seeds or people, bloodlines, right? If therefore that which is sown be not turned upside down, so the evil seeds are, are now grown up and they must be turned upside down. For if that which is sown be not turned upside down, if these evil people, their evil ways, their evil systems be not turned upside down, and if the place where the evil is sown pass not away, this current world, then can it not, or then cannot it come that is sown with good, right? The immortal time and the great world to come after this present evil world cannot come 
unless this present evil world and the evil people in it are turned upside down and pass away. For the grain of evil, excuse me, for the grain of evil seed hath been sown in the heart of Adam from the beginning. And how much ungodliness hath they brought up unto this time? And how much shall it yet bring forth unto the time of threshing come? Ponder now by thyself. Ask within thyself. Consider these things, Ezra. And for those of us, we are to consider these things now. How great fruit of wickedness the grain of evil seed hath brought forth. And when the ears shall be cut down, which are without number, how great a floor shall they fill? Then I answered and said, how and when shall these things come to pass? Wherefore are our years few and evil? And he answered me saying, do not thou hasten above the most highest. For thy haste is in vain to be above him. For thou hast much exceeded. Ezra is getting ahead of himself. Did not the souls also of the righteous ask question of these things in their chambers, saying, How long shall I hope on this fashion? When cometh the fruit of the floor of our reward? And unto these things Uriel the archangel gave them answer and said, Even when the number of seeds is filled in you, for he hath weighed the world in the balance. By measure hath he measured the times, and by number hath he numbered the times, and he doth not move nor stir them until the said measure be fulfilled. So this is, Ezra's been given an understanding that everything in its due time, there is a time and a season for everything. There is a time when, when all of the prophecies all of the Most High's will is fulfilled. It happens a stage at a time, not all at once, a stage at a time. And everything has its appointed time when it will be fulfilled. So does it also apply to the prophecies of the Old Testament. Everything in its time. This is the wisdom, the knowledge, and understanding that we need to have in order to help us to understand who God is and how he works. That his word is true. And just because we don't see things happening in the time frame we believe they should happen doesn't mean he's not fulfilling his word. Doesn't mean he has changed his mind. Doesn't mean he has forsaken the way that he has told us about. It just means we need to be patient and stop trying to consider things that are higher than us. Stop trying to rush him. Do not hasten above the most highest, as Ezra was told. For thy haste is in vain. Stop being in a hurry to see his word fulfilled. Otherwise, you're not going to believe it. And so what they're saying is that it's not, it's not a problem to desire to want to see his 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 word fulfilled in a hurry but if it causes you to question him if it not being fulfilled in in a hurry causes you to question him then that's when you know you know you're moving too fast you're getting ahead of yourself and you probably need to pump the brakes a bit slow down and just let him do his thing trust him trust his word and see when you know that his word is good and that he will uh fulfill the intents of his heart all of it then you know what to trust in. You don't just, you know, you know that you can trust him because you know that he fulfills his word. You know what to trust in because he tells you what to trust in. Right? All right. So let's go to, we're going to stay in second Ezra. We're going to go to chapter seven. Second Ezra chapter seven, verse six. Yes, verse six. There is also another thing. A city is builded and set, and set upon a broad field and is full of all good things. Now, Ezra is, is given a vision of his great city. 
and it's a similitude of the kingdom to come. So that is what's being discussed here. New Jerusalem, the kingdom to come. The entrance thereof is narrow and is set in a dangerous place to fall like as if there were a fire on the right hand and on the left, a deep water. So the entrance to the kingdom is narrow and is set in a dangerous place to fall like as if there were a fire on the right hand and on the left, a deep water. Picture this. And one only path between them both, even between the fire and the water, so small that there could but one man go there at once. You can't go there hand in hand. Multiple people can't go at a time. It's like single file. You can't bring anybody with you. You can't, you're, can't, you can't be responsible for getting anybody else there. They have to make the journey for themselves. Each one of us has to make the journey through this dangerous place for ourselves, okay? If this city now were given unto a man for an inheritance, the Israelites, if he, the Israelites, shall pass the danger set before it, I'm sorry, if the Israelites never shall pass the danger set before it, how shall he receive this inheritance? So again, we understand that the Israelites are the ones to inherit the kingdom. Our inheritance is the kingdom. And the kingdom and the, the entrance to the kingdom is set in a dangerous place. It's narrow and set in a dangerous place. Right? And so that means Israelites, the Israel the, of the Most High God has to pass through this narrow, dangerous place in order to reach their inheritance. That is the reason why we have gone through all the evil that we have had to endure. That's the reason why we are his firstborn. We will be the first of, the, of his fruit, the first of his harvest. We were the first to go through these things. We're the, we're the first to be made ready for the kingdom, right? If we didn't go through the dangerous road to the kingdom that we have gone on, experienced all the evil that we have experienced, we would never be able to receive our inheritance. And there are people who desire to steal our inheritance and they have never gone through the dangerous places. They've never walked the narrow path. But yet they want our inheritance. They want to skip the dangerous part. They want to skip the trials of life. They want to skip being tried in the furnace of, of affliction. They want to skip being purged in the fire and, and being made pure. They want to skip all that. And they want to skip past the people who have endured all of that. That's a great evil. That's a great evil. And I said, it is so, Lord. Then said he unto me, even so also is Israel's portion. You see that? Israel's portion is the kingdom. Israel's inheritance. And in order to get their inheritance, the Israelites had to endure great trouble, oppression, captivity, and evils of all varieties in order to reach the place of our blessing. But the other nations, again, they want to skip ahead in the line. Not only do they want to skip ahead of us in line, they want to skip around the difficult obstacle course, so to speak, 
that we all have to go through to get to it. That is foolishness. Right? It says, because for their sakes I made the world. They're who? Israel. The world, the entire earth was made for Israel. That is the reason why he, cre he created the, or the world in the first place. He's letting you know, I created the earth for Israel. And when Adam transgressed my statutes, then was decreed that now is done. That's when it was all set in motion. The things that are now done was set in motion when Adam fell, when Adam transgressed. Then were the interests of this world made narrow, full of sorrow and travail, the interests into the world to come. They are but few and evil, full of perils and very painful. For the interests of the elder world were wide and sure and brought immortal fruit. Right? For the interests of the elder world, because meaning the world before this one that now exists. Right? Uh, let me go back. Verse 12, again, when I, I said, the, then were the interests of this world made narrow. No, it wasn't the world before. It is the world now. And it's being contrasted with the world before, the world that existed before Adam's fall. The interests of the elder world were wide and sure and brought immortal fruit. If then they that live labor not to enter these straight and vain things, they can never receive those that are laid up for them. You see that? Israelites, if we don't labor to enter these straight and vain things, we can never receive those that are laid up for us. And how is it that you Gentiles can believe that you can receive these things without entering these straight and vain things? That makes no sense. His children had to jump through hoops and go through level 1000 difficulty level to get to the kingdom. But you expect to get there not only in place of Israel, ahead of Israel, in Israel's stead, but you expect to do it on level one, two, or three. You expect to be raptured out of here and never have to go through a troublous time. Israel has gone through a great time of trouble. We have been through the fire. We have paid with our lives and and with blessings in this world, we have had to sacrifice and be deprived of great blessings in this world in order to be worthy of the world to come, in order to receive our treasures in the world to come. Because this world, as it stands, is not for us. This place is not where we are to receive our inheritance. That's the reason why the Negroes seem to be at the bottom, because this is not the place and time of our rest. Ours is the world to come. The other nations had their, their time now. Okay. Now, therefore, why disquietest thou thyself, seeing thou art but a corruptible man? And why art thou moved, whereas thou art but mortal? And this is what we end up doing to ourselves. We disquiet ourselves, you know, because we we get stressed out thinking of things that are above our level of understanding. And even in certain things, even if you pray for them, and even if you are deemed righteous, you still just may not receive what you're looking for, as Ezra was told. And he would not be told everything in which he wanted to know. And he wasn't a wicked man. He was deemed righteous. And he was beloved of the highest, but still was not worthy to receive the knowledge of all of the things that he pursued. And neither can we or will we. Not now. Not now. But in due time, in measure, 
we will receive the things that he has uh, declared we will receive. And I say declared because it's all by prophecy. His word has already went forth what we will receive and when we will receive it. We are promised gifts of the spirit that we will receive and are receiving and they cannot be withheld from us by any man. By any deity. <laughs> and I laugh because there is no such thing as any God outside of the God of the Bible. But I say that it's because people make their own gods. And many of these gods that they have are men. They they made men their gods. Your Christian pastors inside of this this awakening that we have, you know, there are people who are leading these different groups and camps and so forth. They are made deities, gods by their followers who don't have the information that they are themselves looking for. But they make it seem as if they have all of the truth, 100% knowledge, and that anybody who don't have all of the knowledge that they have, that you are wicked. You have to be careful who you're following. Be very careful. Try the spirits by the spirit, whether they be of God or not. All right? We were told how to spot them. We were told you know them by their fruits. Let's get Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. He's talking about the Israelites. You're seeing Something very familiar, right? Out of what we just read in the second Ezra. Sound like Paul is saying the same thing here, right? Confirming the souls of the, of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, hear that? Through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. The Negroes are the real Israelites and we are the ones who have gone through much tribulation to enter into the kingdom of God. And why do you Christians believe that you will be able to enter into the kingdom of God without going through much tribulation? Why would you believe that it's possible? That is a vain thing. That's why the scripture says, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. These people who imagine being able to supplant the Israelites and take the inheritance of the Israelites without having to experience the much tribulation that the Israelites experienced, without having to walk through the narrow and dangerous path to get to the kingdom. They expect to be raptured out of the earth and saved from any sort of trouble and tribulation. That's foolishness, according to God. Right? So, coming back to 2nd Ezra chapter 7, let's go down to verse 57. Then answered he me and said, this is the condition of the battle, which man that is born upon the earth shall fight, that if he be overcome, he shall suffer as thou hast, but if he get the victory, he shall receive, he shall receive the thing that I say. For this is the life whereof Moses spake unto the people, to Israel, while he lived, saying, Choose thee life that thou mayest live. Nevertheless, they believed not him, nor yet the prophets after him, 
no, nor me, which have spoken unto them. That there should not be such heaviness in their destruction as shall be joy over them that are persuaded to salvation. Salvation is for the Israelites. And many have to be persuaded to salvation. And here, here we are through prophets, through people teaching like myself, trying to persuade you unto salvation. Trying to reason with you out of the scripture to get you to walk the narrow path, the straight path, to equip you with what you need in order to endure tribulation and struggle and to not give up because that's when many people will give up because they believe that being blessed means you will not go through difficult times. That is not the truth. The truly blessed who are the Israelites are promised that we would indeed go through troublous times, that we would indeed go through rough times, hard times. We would struggle. We would be oppressed. We would be enslaved. We would be beaten down. That's why we, we have much heaviness. Right? That's why we have much heaviness. And in verse 60, again, let's get it again. Nevertheless, they believe not him, Moses, nor yet the prophets after him. No, nor me which have spoken unto them. And this is something that is, is true for, <clears throat> excuse me, awakened Israelites, those that are still asleep, and the Gentiles as well, all alike, right? They do not believe the prophets. They didn't believe what Moses said. They don't believe what the prophets said. None of them, all the prophets spoke of the promises that the father has spake unto the people. And yet they say, oh, those are the Old Testament promises. That's not applicable today. But that's incorrect. That means they don't believe they didn't believe the prophets. And if they don't believe the prophets, meaning they really didn't believe who sent them, meaning they didn't believe God. They didn't hear the word of God, the word of truth, and it resonated with them as truth is because they do not have the Holy Spirit. Remember, Christ says, Mashiv, hear my voice. And it is Christ often speaking in the Old Testament. He's the one a lot of times giving these prophecies, giving these promises. And because these people are not his, sh his sheep, they didn't hear his voice. They couldn't hear what he was saying. They couldn't believe it. They cast his word behind them as a thing of naught, right? Again, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Many there be that go in through the wide gate, through the broad way that leadeth to destruction, right? The gate is an entrance into something. What entrance into what? An entrance into what, right? That's, the, that's one question. But wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. That's what it is. That's the answer. If you are walking through the wide gate, that gate leads to destruction. And many there be which go in there at. And so Christianity is a gate. Many believe it is the gateway to the kingdom of heaven, to the kingdom of God. That's what many believe. They also boast and understand that Christianity is the world's largest religion. Islam following closely behind it. Right. And they are both the wide gate. Islam is a wide gate and Christianity is a wide gate that lead to destruction. 
You can't have the world's largest religion. And that religion also be the path of truth. When Christ himself tells you that a broad way leads to destruction. He's trying to tell you, he's trying to tell you how to look for the path that you're supposed to be on. If you are going down a path that is a broad way, that is a wide gate, you are going down the wrong path. You are going through the wrong gate. This is what he was trying to tell you. So when you learn, when you see that, okay, Christianity is a large religion. Oh my God, this is a, this is a wide gate. It's a broad way. Wow. I didn't see that before. Now, what are you going to do now that you know that Christianity is a broad way that lead it to destruction? What are you going to do with that information? What are you going to do? Christianity says that everyone who comes to Christ, believes in Christ, is saved. That's what they say. Is saved and, you know, you're considered the church of God. But that's not what Christ even says. How are you a Christian, meaning follower of Christ, but you discount what Christ says? He told you that your religion is going to lead you to destruction. You're not following him. You're following Satan. Satan is the Pied Piper of Christianity. Verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Sounds a lot like what we read in 2nd Ezra, right? Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. This sounds exactly like what we read in 2nd Ezra. Exactly. So you've been given everything that you need in order to be armed for this journey. But when you don't trust Christ or when you can't hear his voice, you're going to err in the way. When you trust your Christian pastors and you don't trust the word of God, you're going to greatly err in your journey. Be careful. Be very, very careful. All right. In Proverbs chapter two, verse one, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, that you have to receive his words and hide his commandments with you, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom. You have to incline your ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, meaning he hides it. He reserves sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the, path of, the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. You're being given the keys, the instruction on how to get to where you claim you're trying to go. But will you give heed? My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. He told you how to find good favor, how to find favor and good understanding. 
in the sight of God and man. He says, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. Your heart means your mind, your brain. Right? Constantly, you're supposed to constantly think about, think upon the scriptures. You're supposed to be in the scriptures all the time so that you're constantly thinking about these things. That's how you write them about your neck and upon the table of your heart, your mind. So shalt thou find favor. This is how you'll find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. All right, this is very important. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with, thy with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth even as a father, the son in whom he delighted. Look at what Israel went through. As a nation, we went through great trouble and evil because of what we've done. He corrected us. He has chastised us. As a nation, we had to go through slavery and great oppression. Extremely difficult times, generation after generation. Because of what we did as a nation earlier in our youth. But many Gentiles believe that even though they know that their forefathers were wicked, that their people as a whole were wicked, they don't believe that they should be corrected. They know they have not been corrected and chastened by the Lord as a nation. They know this, but it says that he corrects who he loves. If he didn't correct you as a nation for your wickedness, he doesn't love you. We know the people who he corrected, right? As a father, the son in whom he delighteth, right? Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. This is what it's all about. Your journey through life should, all, should be all about getting wisdom and understanding. Otherwise, what are you doing? Everything in this life is pure vanity. You're supposed to be in pursuit of the world to come. Proverbs chapter four, verse one. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth, forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee, love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Wisdom is the most important thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting. So while you're out there getting wisdom, get understanding. Exalt her and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings. And the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. And when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Enter not into the path of the wicked and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. Christianity is the path of the wicked. 
It is the way of evil men. Your instruction is to avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. Have nothing to do with it. For they sleep not except they have done mischief and their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall because they are the, the, the seat of Satan. Their desire is to get as many people to fall as possible because they themselves enter not into the kingdom. And their desire is to have as many people as possible go to that lake of fire with them. Misery loves company. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. This sounds like Satan's version of the Last Supper, right? Yeah. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. More and more, right? Meaning not all at once. In measure, we receive wisdom in measure. We receive more and more as time goes. So the things that I know now are all subject to be updated. I reserve the right to go back on anything that I'm saying, given new information, because with new information, you know, you're supposed to grow. You're supposed to update your thinking, not hold on to your old way. So now that you're hearing all of this new information, what are you going to do about your old way? Are you going to hold fast to it, even in light of everything you are now learning? What are you going to do? I have some other scriptures that I, I was going to bring, but for the sake of brevity, I'm going to cut this short. I'm going to skip to my last verse that I want to get out. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So I say to my brethren in the Christian church, my brethren in Islam, my brethren who are atheists, my brethren who are in Hinduism, in whatever ism you are in, come out. Awake, you are still asleep. You think that you have awakened, but you're sleepwalking. Arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, cautiously, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So being unwise is to not understand what the will of the Lord is. If you are discounting the Old Testament, you are ignorant to what the will of the Lord is. Christ says, I'm not come to do my will, but his that sent me. I come to do the will of my father. Where do you learn of the will of the father? The Old Testament. So if Christ tells you he's come to do the will of the father and the will of the father is contained in the Old Testament. Why does your Christian doctrine say that the Old Testament is done away with? It is null and void. That is a direct conflict with the words of Christ. And you call yourselves Christians, followers of Christ. Blasphemy. Pure blasphemy. The promises of God are sure. The prophecies of the Old Testament are his promises. And a promise made is a promise kept by the Heavenly Father. So, and for that, we are thankful and we give praise, honor, and all the glory to Abba Yahweh to our king, Hamashiach Yahweh Shad. 
if you have gathered anything from this, as I always say, don't hoard it. Pay it forward. Each one reach one. Shalom.